Well, welcome and thank you very much for joining us in this uh, webinar from victims to actors of just transitions, lessons from the Lucas Aerospace Workers Plan. Before introducing the speakers, let me all the participants uh, remind you that to keep your microphones muted while others are speaking, kindly introduce yourself, your country and organization in the chat box. And finally, feel free to type your comments and questions on the inputs of the two speakers while they present. Back to the topic of our webinar, we are very pleased to have with us today Phil Asquith, former chairman of the Lucas Aerospace Combined Shop Stewards Committee from the Burnley side, and Professor Nora Ratzel from Umea University in a conversation about the workers' plan at the Lucas Aerospace and its significance for today's struggles for social ecological transformations. The structure of the webinar is as follows. There will be a brief presentation of the Lucas plan by Phil, then lessons from this experiment for unions today by Nora, and then we will open for questions and answers from you. Please keep your questions and comments short and to the topic of today's webinar so we can get as many questions as possible. So over to you, Phil. Tell us something more about this fascinating experiment in the 70s. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so for my sins, I was chairman of the Lucas Aerospace Combine Shop Stewards Committee in Burnley in the UK. That was Lucas Aerospace's second largest site in the UK. Um, and within our factory, we, we brought together six manual unions and three staff unions. When the Combine launched the Lucas Plan, or Alternative Corporate Plan, as we entitled it in 1976, none of us dreamt that we would be at conferences 40 years later, and of course no one had heard of Zoom then. I, I'm sure this has endured because the issues that we attempted to confront in the 70s are still with us, albeit on a much grander and a much more urgent scale. So I've been asked, you, asked to give to frame the Lucas plan, and I'll take you through the nuts and bolts in as short a time as I can, which I'm aiming for about 15 minutes. Um, to cram so much into short space of time will be a bit like saying that war and peace was about Russians. So when and how did the Lucas plan evolve? What were the main drivers and concepts behind the plan? I'll try to summarize the main points and then we can have the wider discussion later. So originally the Lucas plan was called the corporate plan, that is it's an alternative to the company's plan of job reductions and movements overseas. The subtitle of our plan was a contingency strategy as a positive alternative to recession and redundancies. So just starting uh, before the beginning, in the late 60s and 70s in the UK, jobs were being lost at an alarming rate. Uh, these were caused by, first of all, the Industrial Reorganisation Committee in the 60s, which was set up by the, the Labour government, Prime Minister Harold Wilson, and its job was to improve productivity of industry. So that meant hundreds of thousands of people losing their job at that particular altar. The second driver, was um, White, uh, sorry, Harold Wilson, who was Prime Minister at the time, Labour Prime Minister, the white heat of the technological revolution, when we were all prom prom promised more leisure time, and the main social problem would be what to do with our leisure time. The reverse happened, and our members and many like them found the white heat of the technological revolution. It was simply burning up jobs. The third driver was the misapplication of science and technology in a Tayloristic way. Um, Frederick Winslow Taylor was the father of scientific management, and it was all about de-skilling and stripping operations to their bare minimum. So his ethos was this, and I quote, in my system, the workman, and it usually was a man then, is told precisely what he is to do and how he is to do it and any improvement he makes is fatal to success. So that was the uh, ideology behind design of production and design processes themselves. 
So this was all about excluding from the process of production and design that which is most precious in people. That is their skill, creativity and ingenuity. This led to the fragmentation and de-skilling of the design and production process, which led in turn to a reduction of worker strength and bargaining power. The new structural, sorry, the new phenomenon of structural unemployment occurred as a result of this, that is jobs that were displaced technologically forever. And in addition to the hemorrhage of jobs uh, through these processes in the 60s and 70s, Labour's manifesto, they were elected twice in 1974, uh, again, as tradition, pledged them to defence cuts and nationalisation of the airframe sector of the aerospace industry. So that was uh, an even uh, new set of problems on top of the ones I've just described. And as 70% of Lupus Aerospace's work was defence, um, we, um, we had a real problem on our hands. At that time in the early 70s, the quadrupling of oil prices didn't help. Um, and it was accompanied by a 27% inflation rate and 15% interest. So those of us who are old enough have seen what's going on today, um, 40, 50 years ago. So our members, therefore, were mainly defence workers. And generally speaking, defence workers have always been given a false choice. That is between arms production or unemployment, where the Combine argued that the real choice for defence workers is between weapons production and socially useful production. But traditionally, when a defence project has been cut or when there's been a threat of a cut, People have ha argued for the retention of the project, irrespective of whether it was needed on the grounds of national security. So by putting forward alternative socially pro useful products, the Combine was attempting to remove the jobs issue from the disarmament debate. Without the Lucas Aerospace Combine, there would have been no Lucas plan. And it's important to understand the structure of British trade unionism at the time. The Combine was formed and consolidated in the late 60s and early 70s because of the Byzantine complexity of the official trade union movement in the United Kingdom. It was still based on the craft structure of the 1990s and hadn't responded to globalisation. So international countries like Lucas could divide and rule a uh, trade union movement with such an archaic structure. So therefore, it was unable to offer effective resistance to this wholesale industrial upheaval, jobs loss and reorganisation and globalisation that I mentioned a few moments ago. So the Combine represented uh, workers in 17 plants, 14 geographical locations, uh, with 18,000 members in total and at least six manual and three staff units, uh, unions. Just about everyone in that industry, whether manual or staff, were very highly skilled. And the combined strength and confidence consolidated by the success of the 1972 strike. The combine was characterized by the fact it wasn't reactive, although it could be. Uh, it uh, preferred to be proactive, to anticipate problems and to get the head on management and even government sometimes. And the Combine was actually described in the classic work on the Lucas Plan as a new trade union, a new trade unionism in the making by Hilary Wainwright and Dave Elliott. So we always like to be ahead of the game. Because of the serious threat of unemployment, the 1974 meeting in January of the Combine had the main agenda items of um, jobs, basically, what would be the strategy on jobs. And around us were taking place various struggles around calls for nationalisation, workings, factory occupations, arguments for the retention of existing product lines, government bailouts being sought right, left and centre. But none of those seemed appropriate for us. We didn't want to go back in and argue for the retention of uh, defence weapons that were unnecessary and against the national policy of most of our unions, actually. So we, we took the point of view as the Combine that a struggle based on the continued manufacture of products that no one wanted was doomed to failure and particularly the case in the weapons industry. So we realized we must provide realistic alternative products. 
The Combine requested a meeting with the new Secretary of State for Industry and the new Labour government, and he was one Tony Benn, well known, the darling of the left, absolutely outstanding man. So in November 74, Ben agreed to meet the Combine, and that meeting was unprecedented because there were no senior officials of the trade unions, no civil servants, and it lasted two and a half hours. And I have to tell you, the national officials and civil servants were outraged. It was just Tony Benn and the Combine. He said to us after a long discussion that our products tend to have a long lead time and we should go back to our sites and our members in particular and look at the machinery facilities um, and skills that we had and look at what else we could make so that if, for example, a, a weapon system was cancelled, we could just say, well, we'll increase our kidney pr dialysis production rate because at that time, 3,500 people were dying in the UK for want of a kidney machine. And in our system, whether it's a weapon or whether it's medical equipment, the taxpayer pays for it anyway. But somehow there's a bizarre definition of profitability that defence uh, equipment is profitable, paid for by the taxpayer, whereas life-saving medical equipment isn't paid for by the taxpayer. So what we saw there was a purely, defin purely political definition of, um, of uh, profit. Tony Benn offered us a tripartite meeting to discuss the whole issue with the company and the national unions, uh, which I'll return to in a moment. At the next combined meeting, we analysed Ben's advice to engage in an alternative corporate strategy uh, de devised by our members. Um, talk about ambitious. We had deep discussion and there was great uncertainty. And the problem was uh, crystallised by our liaison officer, liaison officer, Ron Mills, who sadly we lost in June at the age of 91. Ron said, the problem that constantly faces trade unionists is that when they work to the same criteria as the company's accountants, their impact is marginal as they become part of the crisis rather than the victims. A workers' corporate plan would become marginalized too, unless we work to radically different and unorthodox criteria. More discussion, more uncertainty, but we were making progress. Then uh, our uh, great comrade, the late Mike Cooley, brought together the sentiments of many of the combined speakers. Mike said the only way in which we could be involved in a corporate plan would be if we grew it in a way which challenged the private profit motive of the company and instead talked about profit, social profit. If we propose socially useful products, what will be said then? The only way we could do this would be completely independently of the company. So we turned down Tony Benn's offer of a tripartite meeting with the company and the national officials of the unions who were hostile to the Combine as a grass movements organisation anyway, even though we were all elected and all holding credentials from our own unions. So the way forward suddenly became clear. The Combine decided to draw up an alternative to the company's corporate plan and to do so independently. Our plan would be a plan to save jobs by making products to fulfil the unmet needs of society. Products would be measured by their use value, not their exchange value. The chief executive of Lucas Industries, after all, said he was charged with the ruthless execution of the Lucas Industries corporate plan. So why shouldn't the Combine do the same, but with saving, not losing? jobs as its focus. So that was the way forward. Um, we had the decision endorsed by our members at traditional mass meetings. We realized we were going into uncharted waters. There were no tri trade union manuals on alternative plans. There were no precedents. We thought we would be walking a tightrope, but we didn't see any alternative. And if we didn't do it, we thought our members would be let down. If we didn't, particularly as we've been encouraged by Tony Benn, and after all, wasn't this what the Labour Party stood for? We'd be in conflict with the company, but we always were. Uh, and this fit the Labour Party policy perfectly. And indeed, I was at the Labour Party conference when the Lucas Workers' Plan was endorsed unanimously by conference. So the Combine decided formally, supported by its members, to produce its own corporate plan, now known as the Lucas Plan. The plan took a year to produce, and uh, 
I don't have the time to go into the detail because I've got an eye on the clock as I'm speaking, uh, but we can cover some of that in the discussion. But we um, we had mass meetings, as I said, to explain things in more detail. We had teachings, discussions, meetings within the factory, and we engaged the TV and the local press in, in the discussion. We also approached uh, academics in universities who were known to be sympathetic because the Combine took the view that the universities and their consultancy paid for by taxpayers and our members were just used by companies and very rarely trade unionists. So it was about time the trade unionists had some of what they were, were paying. And some of the academics were, were most, most and more than helpful. So the phrase socially useful product became uh, into popular circulation at the time. Uh, we were wanting to produce socially useful products and putting the emphasis on using technology to help people rather than subjugate or even kill them. And when we uh, started putting the plan together from uh, after about nine months work, uh, we grouped the product suggestions into six areas, um, two of the main ones being renewable energy and medical technology. And I actually have um, here the, the original draft of the alternative energy section of the corporate plan. And you might be amused and interested to know that the terminology that we use for um, CO2 uh, release into the atmosphere then, the term used then was thermal pollution. Um, this section contains recommendations to diversify into wind turbines, hybrid cars, electric cars, solar power, fuel cells, and so on. And, and this is um, 1975, I'm talking, this, this came around. I have also here the company's response, which contains the phrase that they don't see any large scale future market for wind turbines. So that's interesting. But the plan wasn't just about alternative products, which I'm not going to detail at the moment too, too much. The plan also shines the way in which products were produced, where in a tailoristic way, skill and creativity were being designed out of the production and the design process. We proposed, proposed a reversal of this to human-centered production systems to develop people's skill and creativity rather than to design it out of the process. It was axiomatic, therefore, that we were challenging the misuse and abuse of science and technology. These aren't a given, and their use is directed and for too long away from the socially useful economy. The plan also challenged design for built-in obsolescence, products designed to wear out when prematurely, sorry, to wear out prematurely, fueling a throwaway economy with all of the wastage of the planet's resources that engenders. And it was clear even then that a world economy based on endless growth could not be sustained by the earth. So we launched the plan in London. Uh, we had a big meeting at our site in Burnley, which was filmed and still um, forms part of an open university course on technology. We expected a reaction, but we didn't expect anything like the reaction that followed in the next few months. It might be a slight exaggeration to say that the plan went viral, but that, that's how it felt at the time. Uh, before the phrase was invented. The international reaction was overwhelming and supportive, as, as was the reaction at home, from all sorts of different groups. What spooked the company, I thought, was when their own side, so to speak, uh, came out against them. For example, the right-wing Financial Times said that the plan was one of the most advanced yet prepared in the UK by a group of shop stewards one of the most radical alternative plans for their company. The Engineer magazine called it a 20th century version of the Industrial Revolution. And Industrial Management said in July 76, the document is worth serious consideration for it demonstrates clearly that if workers don't carry out their jobs to the satisfaction of workers, sorry, managers don't carry out their satisfaction, then those same workers have the capability and know how to do it for them. And we might touch on our encroachment into the area of uh, management prerogatives a little later on in the discussion. So uh, there was quite an earthquake and we, we had to set up a speakers committee. We sent speakers um, all parts of Europe, all parts of Scandinavia, 
the United States, Australia, we were absolutely overwhelmed in a tsunami of requests for discussions and presentations on the plan. And um, we did lots of work at home too. Now, it's often written that the Lucas plan failed. And that's, that's written, uh, I think, simply because it was rejected not only by the company, but at the critical meeting, the Labour government rejected the plan, despite um, the conference decision mandating them to support the Lucas worker, Lucas plan. And um, national union officials were antagonistic because they were basically against grassroots trade union organisations US usurping their power. So it's often written that the plan failed, but I'd like you to consider that, uh, this. Uh, I think the plan made an enduring contribution to arms conversion, workers' control, and the humanising technology debate over the last 45 years. Workers supported by academics were proven right. Uh, management in the Labour government and much of the trade union establishment were wrong. They rejected the products which I've described, like hybrid engines, wind turbines, and so on, all commonplace and largely manufactured overseas. And that's the familiar story of British industry. And I make no apologies at all um, when I say that the trade unions were right and the establishment was wrong. But the original objective of the plan, you'll recall, was to save our members' jobs. And during the many years that we were active in Lucas Aerospace on the plan, not one of our members lost their job on a compulsory basis. So all of the jobs of our members were saved, which was the original objective of the plan. And in the final minute, I want to just read to you Mike Cooley's quote when he received the Life, uh, the Right Livelihood Award in Sweden um, for human-centered technology and the Lucas Plan. We were actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, but we didn't really expect to get that. And the Right Livelihood Award is uh, sometimes known as the alternative Nobel Peace Prize, but I know the Right Livelihood Society don't like that tag. And Mike said this in the concluding section of his speech, and I think this encapsulates what the Lucas Plan was all about. Science and technology are not given. They're not like the sun or the moon of the stars. It's made by people like us, and if it's not doing for us what we want, we have a right and responsibility to change it. We've got to remember that the future isn't out there, like space is waiting to be discovered. The future has to be built by people like you and I, and we do have real choices. It can be a future in which we are not threatened with mass annihilation through nuclear weapons or ravaged with hunger. It really could be a world in which we treasure all our people equally and get science and technology to serve, serve people rather than the other way around. In a sentence, we could begin to perform the modern miracle. We could help the blind see, the lame walk, and we could feed the hungry. And that really is a great encapsulation of what the Lucas Plan was all about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, for this really wonderful presentation and sharing with us this exceptional example of workers' skills, creativity, and ingenuity. Nora, back to you now. So what will be the main learnings from this example in light of the environmental crisis facing humanity today? And how does this experiment aligns with the argument you've been making on the importance of making workers feel that they are actors and not victims of just transition? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, for this talk. I'm always, uh, every time when I hear that, I've, I'm really inspired by what you did, how you did it, what you said. And I mean, the main thing I think that workers and trade unions can learn today is uh, to be able and to have the courage to take things into their hands. And I would say that that is something that doesn't happen enough in the trade union movement of today. I mean, when David Azzel and I did our research on the policies of trade unions in different countries of the world, we asked trade unionists whether they knew something about the Lucas plan. And many of them said, yeah, we're talking about it under the radar. 
So they don't want to talk officially about it, but they know about it and they know that that is a perspective for them. So I'm going to look at my three points here that I'm thinking um, that I have thought up about, especially what we can learn from the Lucas plan. So um, one thing that we learn is that trade unions should really go to their workforce, not see them as victims of a process where they have to protect them from changing the job and uh, doing something else, but they have to go to them and ask them what their capabilities are, what their skills are, what their perspectives are in the light of the environmental crisis that we are experiencing, because this means that all the production processes, and I include the service processes, need to change uh, transformatively, if you can say that in English. So all the workers, men and women, wherever they work, have to change their workplace. But they have, as the Lucas uh, process shows, they have the skills and capabilities to suggest uh, alternatives to the way in which they're working. And of course, these alternatives are on different levels. So you can have alternatives and not change the production process much, say, okay, we're dealing with waste in a different way and so on and so forth. But you can also think about, okay, maybe our production process has to disappear completely, like oil production, uh, coal production and so on. What can we do instead? What skills do we have? Or what new skills do we want to learn? But also on a broader level, I think, because of the situation in which we are now, we also have to think, or workers and all of us have to think about how do we want to change the way in which working life, paid employment, and other ways of life, like social life, caring for others, being cared by others, uh, how do we balance these different activities and the ways of working and living that we have today? So just a few more points. Um, inspired by the Lucas Place experience, Lucas Plan experience, sorry. Um, we have started a project where we're working together with workers in something like a course that we do for them, but in reality, um, we exchange knowledge in those courses. And what we have learned already in the first course that we did in Spain with trade unionists from six different sectors of the economy is that people do have a lot of knowledge about the production process and also about the environmental impact of their process, the negative impact, which is something that uh, we're interested in especially. And um, they have been thinking about how, making, how to make changes to their processes. And one of the problems they have is how do they get the message through to their colleagues? So how can the workers in the production processes that know that things have to change, work together with their workers so to convince them? Maybe that is something that Phil can tell us about how they manage to do that in their times. And of course, there is the power and resistance of employers to any kind of changes that are suggested by workers. This is still the, play, the case today, as it used to do in the times of the Lucas plan. And uh, funnily enough, I've just been at a conference in Finland, and I was discussing with a trade unionist there you know, what is their way of thinking about how to transform the production processes or change production altogether in the light of the environmental crisis? And he told me, well, he did a, they did a survey among 2,000 shop stewards in Finland, asking them what were the main obstacles to changing the production processes for them to be more environmentally sound. And he said, and the main obstacle they mentioned was that the employers <clears throat> don't want it and they have the power, full stop. And I thought, and I said, well, 
employers have always had the power and they were always more powerful than workers in the first instance, but that hasn't stopped trade unionists to fight for the rights and for um, human working relations. So why does it stop trade unions today to fight for in more environmentally sound workplaces? So there was some silence there, I have to say. So, but with our work, with the workers we had in our course, we also learned that um, they know that we also have to change work in terms of working less, having less employed, um, less salaried work in order to be able to do other kinds of work. For instance, one worker said to us, well, I work for a living, but how that best help me if I don't have time to live, right? I thought that was a very nice sentence. So, what we can learn from the Lucas plan, I think, is mainly the idea that workers have the knowledge, they have the skills, they have the creativity to be able to be the agents of the transformation of their workplaces. And one problem that uh, official and, well, I, don't, I won't say official, I would say trade unions, a lot of trade unions in general have today, is still the same problem that Phil was talking about, that they see workers as victims and they see only themselves, the trade union officials, as the actors of change. And they don't do enough work to go back to the people that they are representing and ask them, you know, how can we work with you? What are your ideas? What are your perspectives? I think that's absolutely crucial to happen worldwide if we want to really survive the ecological threats that we are subjected to today. And I wanted to, to finish, I wanted to ask Phil the question, whether he could uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, the obstacles, the challenges that they met and how they overcame them in terms of organizing the workforce to take part in this process of developing alternative forms of production. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Nora. Phil, would you like to take Nora's question first? Well, uh, I, I, I'll take that and then let's give space for someone else to come in. Yeah, um, It's important to, when I said without the combine, there wouldn't have been a Lucas plan. Um, the way that history records the Lucas plan is almost exclusively just about the Lucas plan. There's not so much about how the organisation that produced the plan actually came into being. Because whilst there were other combines in other industries, um, they weren't universal because Britain didn't have industrial unionism. It, it just didn't um, grow like that. So when I, when I just outline one or two things, I'll try and keep it fairly tight. So the combine was um, built in the early 60s. And the biggest barrier to overcome was the barrier between, um, I'll use the old fashioned terms, blue collar workers on production and white collar workers, the designers and the technologists, because the white collar workers were better paid, better pension schemes and so on. One of the earliest campaigns that the uh, Combine got involved in, and there'd been one or two before this, was um, pensions. It was a campaign to harmonize pensions. All of the sites of Lucas Aerospace were paid at different rates, weekly, weekly wage rates and the pensions for the staff were a lot better. So it was agreed and it wasn't easy and it took a struggle. First of all, to start the process of change, who has the power in the pension scheme? The trustees, seven of them, all nominated by the company for both the blue and white collar schemes. So we ran a campaign, a poster campaign, combine led it, and we actually got three trade union combine trustees out of seven. Now that didn't give us a majority, but it gave us access to all the information. So, right, this was something to harmonize the blue and white collar conditions. And we persuaded 
our staff members to stand still whilst the, 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 uh, the blue collar workers came up. Easy for me to say, I lived through it. It was so hard to do. There was a science and technology advisory service set up so that if new processes were being introduced, usually by the staff people, um, the blue collar people were on the receiving end. We set up a, a science and technology advisory service. So it was all about trust building, but it took a lot of doing. Uh, and there were several successes that then gave the confidence for the Burnley strike and then gave the confidence to get involved in, in something as ambitious as the Lucas plan. So there's, there's a whole background to building the organization in, in, the, in the face of opposition from the national and regional officials who didn't like grass trade union, grassroots trade unionism. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, for that. Um, while we're waiting for more questions and comments from uh, our uh, webinar participants, if I may pose a question to you, Phil, and to Nora. Do you feel first, the workers have always been somehow involved in efforts to actually protect the environment, even if that might be just with their demands for health and safety at work. But in this particular case, uh, the workers were actually challenging the management prerogatives, something that you mentioned briefly in your presentation, on what to produce, going actually straight into challenging the capitalist system. So can you share with us how did workers feel about it and how empowering was it and how much of a reason was for this project to be so let's say rejected. I totally agree with you. We shouldn't yeah. say failing, but actually be rejected. And Nora, to you, one point made by Phil, but also the paper that you co-authored with uh, David Uzel and Dave Elliott, Can Trade Unions Become Environmental Innovators, is that in the case of Workers' Plan, the shop stewards managed to actually overcome the divisions between blue and white collar workers a term which is problematic in that it suggests this separation between mental and manual work. But for the sake of the argument, how important is this lesson today? Right, am I going first? Okay. Um, Lucas, like any other management, will talk to you for as long as you want to talk to them. They'll talk to you forever about safety shoes, um, you know, things which are important if you need them. They'll talk to you forever. Once you get onto what they see as their traditional managerial prerogatives, the shutters come down, they won't talk to you. And they will defend that with their dying breath. This is, this is the case in the 70s. I don't quite know what it's like now. Um, so when they started saying to us in the plant, the plant, our plant management are quite sympathetic, actually. We, we actually talk them in to developing a gas powered heat pump. You hear lots about heat pumps now, electric ones. We actually talk them into developing a gas powered heat pump in our factory with the Open University. Uh, that has certain energy advantages, which I won't go into at the moment. And, and we built it and it ran and it was fine. Um, so, you know, we, we did, we we're always doing deals on the side with them. So, nationally, they wouldn't negotiate or talk to us. Uh, but locally they would. But generally speaking, any British manager, no matter what level, saw uh, any attempt to influence, in this case, what the company produced, they would resist with their dying breath. It was like an extension of the British class system. Um, and uh, I, I'll just stop there and, and pass over to you, to you Nora. Yeah. I must say, I haven't done any research about this relationship between blue collar workers and white collar workers. So I cannot do a really, cannot give a really in-depth answer to that. I can only do uh, give an answer given uh, from the experiences we have with the course. And interestingly, uh, after you were speaking to our course, Phil, uh, the trade unionists who are all blue collar workers or even if they are in the service sector, I mean, you wouldn't call it that way, but they're not in this higher ranging uh, professional kind of jobs. They all said, you know, 
this is the arrow that they made that they tried to work together with white collar workers because it will always end up in conflicts and we cannot do that. So this is only some kind of experience I have from this course with workers, which was quite interesting because they were from six very different sectors. So given that evidence, which is not an evidence, accidental evidence perhaps, uh, there seems to be still quite a conflict between mm -hmm. these different mm -hmm. kinds of workers because of the privileges that white collar workers have. Uh, given the resistance of the management, I think we are a bit better now because of the environmental crisis we are in. Even management knows things have to change. They just cannot stay the way they are. So one tiny, another one tiny but interesting um, experience from our course was that one of our workers went to a, a second plant that exists in his company that is managing waste. And he found out that that waste management doesn't go well for reasons that we cannot go into detail here. And he wrote to his management and said, I'm in this course, blah, 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 blah. And we're learning this and that. And I have learned that the waste management is bad because of this. And the result was, that the management is now employing a person, who, uh, an additional person who is now responsible for waste management in the company. So it's also it's a small thing that happened. But I think if you put it into the bigger picture, it means it is that even management is now more open to suggestions because they know they need to change, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way, the time for Lucas plan, alternative plans has come now. It's mm. the conditions are in a certain way better than at your time. Thank you, Nora. And is there something you wanna add on that, Phil, since you have firsthand experience in this bringing together uh, blue collar and white collar? Yeah, well, when we used to meet in pubs in dark corners and plot the revolution, you know, in the early days, um, there was a faction that wanted to sort of storm the town hall and uh, you know burn down the Reichstag. That, that, that's how. And then the groups of were more democratic, and <laughs> that, that that wasn't the favoured option. But the discussion revolved on pensions. How I mean, there's been a strong workers' control movement in this country for years, and they have annual conferences and so on. But uh, quite a big movement built up by saying that the way to control or influence capital and the companies is to actually do it through the pension funds. So as I already said, um, we were able to get three of seven trustees on both Lucas pension funds. And it was a long, uh, hard work, but we did it. Now, had we got four out of seven trustees, what difference would have that, that made? Because we would have then controlled where our members' money was invested. And if you look at the amount of money that is held in workers' pension funds, where they have no rights whatsoever, the amount of money and the industry is, is phenomenal. So there was actually quite a strong movement that started in the country in the 70s and in the 80s, particularly with respect to local authority pension funds to actually get democratically elected trade union trustees on at least the minority of the pension funds. And then I, I suggest that if they would then taken control of the pension funds, I think the government then would have reacted quite viciously because company law in our country still says that the primary job of a company is shareholders look after the shareholders, not the workers. So there's a strong movement to, try to actually influence management and the control of industry and society, in fact, through the voting rights that should go to workers' pension contributions. Uh, but that's, that's it. You don't hear much about that said these days. Thank you. We have uh, quite a bit of movement in our chat section. Um, 
if you could fill, um, just explain a bit more on the uh, social profits uh, that you were mentioning earlier from Abdur. We have a question from Ulf. What is happening in the UK today? Are there any good examples that you can highlight and describe that, um, that are going on today in the new look and what's happening in the new look as planned? We have a question also from Gifford. Could you talk about the tradition of militant shop stewards in the UK going back to the struggles in munition plants in World War I? And I think there is another one from... Ah, okay, so the question of Wolf was more related to Nora's point of view that now is the time for a new Lucas plan. Sorry for that, I saw the comment later. Yeah, as, as far as the new Lucas plan is concerned, um, that, that the original conference that was organized by the new Lucas plan group was in November, 2016. And that was uh, around the time Steve Sprunk's film, The Plan, the three hour documentary that was shown at the British uh, Film Festival in 2018 was made. Um, so there's, they set up groups at the time, one's just transition, one was arms conversion. So there were several different groups set up. Um, for anyone who's particularly interested in that, in two weeks time, the, is it the trans world um, technology workers. There's a conference in two weeks today, a three-day conference, which I'll probably be saying the same stuff at. Uh, but Dave King, who runs the new Lucas Plan group, um, is actually presenting a paper to that. And he is the guy who is right on top of this. So I wouldn't want to be a pay, pay limitation. But there's, there's still, in this country, there's still a lot of activity. And, and most of the energy uh, that's uh, from either the new Lucas Plan Group or affiliated groups, most of it, uh, happily, is going into the Green Jobs Initiative uh, because, you know, people suddenly seeing that there's 11, 11 years, is it, to the tipping point? So most of this type of energy, you know, that, that used to go into the Lucas Plan and CND um, seems to me to be going into initiatives like the, the Green Jobs Initiative. That, 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 that's where it's going and, and it's great to see and what we're trying to do now um, in a fairly amateurish way so far is actually to try and make the energy of all those di different groups to combine them in some way like, like a combine to make the whole effort greater than the sum of the parts but there's there's a distance to go on that yet. Uh, and there will be an, there's there is another conference of the new lucas plan um uh, schedule for some, some time early next year, I believe. And could you tell us something about the uh, question of Gifford on um, tradition of militant shop stewards in the UK going back much earlier than that, and how is that related to the Lucas plan? In, in this country, there's been, I mean, I, I think it goes back to the, the class system. Yeah, that people have had to fight for everything they've got and the fights only ever come from the grassroots. And I think uh, the Industrial Revolution and its legacy in this country uh, was where that grassroots militancy, some people call it self-help actually, came from. Um, that All that peaked in around the 60s and 70s. Um, and this was one of the reasons, as I alluded to, that the Labour government in the 60s and 70s and the national officials, uh, they were seeing dock strikes, that, that they were arguing that this kind of activity was paralyzing the economy without actually looking to why people were taking those actions in the first place. Uh, that um, peaked, and then there was a minor strike in the early 70s, that, that peaked. Um, but then with 13 years of conservative legislation under true trade union legislation, uh, that grassroots uh, militancy it hasn't gone away altogether, but it's I would say it's it's past its peak. And the level of the number of trade unions, uh, trade unionists, trade union members is far far less in this country now than, than it was twenty years ago. Um, so it's it, it, it's still there, but it's not what it used to be. But what you're seeing now, because of inflation in this country. Uh, the, even the nurses 
a vote to go on strike, and he might have seen barristers, right, senior law counsel attorneys, they were on strike outside the Old Bailey in London a couple of months ago. So uh, the, the, the economic problems at the moment are now bringing a surge in grassroots activity and from areas you've never seen it before. No one would ever believe that the guys you see in wigs on crime programs would actually be taking strike action and it's crippling the legal system. So um, it, it has been uh, in a quiescent zone for some time, but it's come back and it's coming back hard and it's coming back from groups who would have never dreamt going on strike before. And we watch this space. Thank you. Nora, would you like to say something on the question of um, Will? You're muted. Good comment from our research projects that we did on trade unionism in, um, in the UK, in Sweden, in Spain, in Brazil, in South Africa, and in India. Uh, if the, the question we asked, what, what are the environmental policies of trade unions in all these countries? And the interesting thing was that those trade unions who had come from uh, fights against um, authoritarian dictatorships, fascism, you know, like in Spain, in South Africa, in Brazil, that those unions were most likely to have environmental policies because they have developed as organizations that are thinking about transforming society at large. While a lot of trade unions who have developed only, and I put that in quotes because that's also a very important and hard struggle, to uh, protect and improve the working conditions at work, those trade unions are less likely now to develop environmental policies because it's not anymore only about the workplace, but it's about what kind of society do we want to have? What kind of work do we want to have in general? You know, and for a lot of trade unions, it's very difficult to change their perspective on working place policies into more societal policies of transforming work in general and the relationship between work and nature. So more radical unions have it easier, so to speak, to, to put the environmental questions and in that way, more societal, broader questions on their agenda. Thank you, Nora. Um, we have a question from Benji from the Philippines. How easy or difficult was it to get rank and file workers to support the Lucas plan? What key arguments got them on board, and what are there, and were there initiatives by other unions and other companies that were similar to Lucas Plan? Yeah, I, I, I'll try and take those in reverse. Um, when we were uh, campaigning on the plan in, in the 70s, a, a good number of other large combined shop shoes committees in large companies did similar things. Uh, the Chrysler manu motor car manufacturing plant in Coventry, um, as part of their annual wage claim, they actually put in, uh, they wanted uh, so much pay rise and so much increase in pensions, but they also wanted uh, a serious discussion with the company to start designing and producing car engines that were more efficient, that had lower pollution, and so, so there was actually an environmental section. I'm talking now about 1978, 1979, and one of my colleagues, Jim Shutt, actually led that particular movement. A similar thing was done by the United Auto Workers Union in the United States. I, I have the papers on it somewhere, but not to hand. But they, they were arguing as part of their pay negotiations with the company um, there's a call coming through on my phone. It's going to disappear. Uh, that's my car that's at the garage, probably a big bill. Um, also in uh, gas turbine manufacturers, gas turbines for power stations in the Northeast, 
there was a combine and they put together a plan which was similar to ours in nature. So there were a number of ones uh, which are documented in the literature that did various variations of, of the Lucas plan. And I have to say they were received much more constructively by, by their, their management. So it did. And then um, when Margaret Thatcher appeared on the scene in 82, um, quite a lot of us were just leaving anyway. Uh, Mike Cooley, Hilary Wainwright, they went, went to work for the Greater London Council. So a lot of principles of social use production and human-centred technology, they actually set up from the Greater London Council and set up a technology network within London. We did a similar thing on a smaller scale at Sheffield City Council. So a lot of the ten tenants of uh, the Lucas Plan, actually then in the 80s, found their way into local authorities. Um, I, I can't remember what the earlier point was. Oh, it was about how do you get people to do something? Yeah, you frighten them. You put the frighteners on. And it was quite easy to do it in our plan because um, I joined in 73. And in 1971, the Rolls-Royce Aero Company went bankrupt. So no more spare parts for airplanes across the world. So uh, the government nationalised them in 24 hours. And a consequence of um, Rolls-Royce crash, who were Lucas Aerospace's biggest customer, was that um, more than half of the people in Lucas Aerospace Burnley lost their jobs. They were just families. They weren't just a man working there or a wife working there. The whole families worked for Lucas. And so whole families became unemployed. So when we started talking to our members about, we'll have to plan for something like that in the future, what do we do? In Burnley and a lot of Lucas Aerospace, we were actually on fertile ground uh, because people have been through such hardship before and um, for the detractors who said well it'll never happen so well what's your idea then put your family out of work again so it, it was partly persuasion it was partly frightening some people were genuinely really enthusiastic uh, there was one guy it went, you know when you're taxiing around sorry i'm going on too long you're taxiing around the airport it's propelled by jet engines highly inefficient polluting he designed a powered nose wheel so that it would just go around on electricity with the engine shut down so there was a whole mix uh, and we also used um, evening teachings we used the local press we used the local television because if people see something on television it's bound to be important and so there was a whole number of things that, that coalesced I'm not saying it was easy it was bloody hard work actually um, but those are a number of the stratagems that we employed to get people interested well, thank you very much. We are reaching almost the end, but perhaps it would be really great to get uh, first from you, Nora, and then from Phil, perhaps some closing remarks uh, for our participants. I think we reached at some point around 50. We are about 50, so it would be great to get your final thoughts on it. Nora? Phil, you start, please. Yeah, OK. Um, there's a lot of information on this subject that's buried away. Um, so, for example, when um, COVID struck, the British Aerospace Wing Plant, they made the wings for Airbus in North Wales, they converted a large section of that um, into um, manufacturing ventilators. They, they designed and manufactured ventilators and they did it very quickly. Um, and there were a lot of, so, I mean, we'd call that conversion uh, if they'd be military aircraft we'd call it arms conversion um, and there were lots of thing, similar things around the country that happened financed by government and you could see a parallel with for the arms conversion movement that we had a situation driven by covid that meant industry had to change overnight government financed it and there are, there are lots of examples of what we call now covid conversion i, I will send you through uh, a paper on that so there's a lot of it um, going on. There was a report provided by the Nuclear Education Trust. Uh, it will be about three, four years ago now, which I'll also send you. And that studies different types of this type of conversion activity in different countries. One of them being South Africa. I've just now noticed uh, an email from someone in Africa. Uh, and it, then it draws out the common factors from the, the community, community campaigns. Some, one was in Berlin actually, 
um, some years ago, but Berlin is a case study there. Um, and um, so the, the, there is actually more of this stuff about. It's that you just don't get to know about it. And one of the most authoritative papers I've seen recently is from Jonathan Feldman, who's at the University of Stockholm. Um, and that, that is a proper rigorous academic study of uh, conversion and the, bar the barriers to, to it and the opportunities for it. So I, I will send them through to you and then Bruce, you, you can disseminate them. That'd be great, thank you. Nora. Yes, I, I will quote Brecht more or less the way in which I have, it, have him in my head. And he said that transformative changes only take place in dead ends. In other words, you know, the crisis, uh, as bad as they are, but they are also conducive to change and sometimes transformative change. So when you see conversion projects today, as Phil said, even today, most of the time is because people are afraid losing their jobs or they have already lost their jobs. And that's when they start changing. It's a pity, it would be nicer to start earlier, but um, it's also a positive way of thinking about crisis also as a way in which new and better things can happen. Thank you very much, Nora. Thanks very much, Phil, for those, such an inspiring presentations and messages in these depressive times, actually. I think we need more of these stories which really uh, emphasize the potential of workers to actually uh, bring about important social ecological transformation and empowering them in this process. Thank you very much to all the participants for joining us. Uh, all the materials that uh, Finn promised to share will be put in the course platform, including the activity in two weeks time, uh, where perhaps you'll know a bit more of what's happening with new people similar plans, the Lucas plan. And um, please, those of you that haven't completed the course, the online course, do so. You can get a certificate. We have added new content on the energy crisis and uh, we invite you all to actually um, watch the video lectures and the reading materials. Thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, have a good evening if you are in Asia, a good afternoon in Africa and Europe and a wonderful day to people joining us from the Americas. So thanks again. Bye, stay safe. Thank you.